Hi guys, very welcome to Mentor and yet another video podcast. As always, I hope you're doing absolutely fantastic. Today on the video, guys, we're going to be talking about lightning strikes to aircraft. When do they happen? Why do they happen? Are they dangerous? And what happens to an aircraft that is built out of a different material, like composites, for example, like the Airbus 350 or the Boeing 787? I'll also tell you a little bit about a lightning strike that I had a few weeks back, so stay tuned. Right guys, this video is brought to you in cooperation with Brilliant.org. Now, Brilliant.org is a website that will help you improve on your mathematical skills and your physics skills, and they will do so in a way that you think is fun and interesting. So if you haven't already checked them out, I have been mentioning them before, then I highly recommend you to do so using the link here below. Okay guys, so, lightning strikes and lightning strikes to aircraft. Now, um, first of all, what we're gonna start discussing is when they happen. In, during what kind of conditions can you expect that an aircraft might be under the risk of being hit by lightning? Well, as you might have, have kind of guessed already, if an aircraft is operating very close to an active thunderstorm, like a cumulonimbus cloud, then the, the chance of being hit by lightning increases, okay? but an aircraft doesn't always have to be close to a put on active thunderstorms in order to be hit by lightning. It is actually enough that they are in the vicinity of a highly charged cloud, which might be a cumulus cloud that's in the building state, for example, or there's a lot of rain activity going on inside of the cloud, and that the aircraft in itself is flying through heavy precipitation. Because what lightning is actually, as you might know by now, um, is static electricity that's being built up by the rubbing of uh, particles like rain, for example, against each other, and is building up charges. Okay, and what happens is that the aircraft gets charged slightly differently than the charge that's inside of the cloud, and when these two meet, they, they form basically a circuit. Okay, so the the charge will try to go in through the aircraft and then find the easiest way down to the ground, and that is a lightning strike. Um, what we try to do as pilots is that we try to avoid this from happening, obviously. Um, and we do so by looking at our weather radar. Now our weather radar will show areas of high uh, moisture content. So if there's a lot of rain inside of a cloud, it will turn up as green initially, then it will turn to amber and then red where it's at the worst. And then turbulence will turn up as magenta little spots, okay? Um, we always avoid active thunderstorms, obviously. And what we try to do is we try to give at least 20 nautical miles um, when we're at a cruising altitude away from a red active thunderstorms. And that's a minimum, so it might be more than that as well. But sometimes when we're on the descent or on approach or during climb, we might be climbing through areas of green, which is just normal rain, okay? And, and this is what happened to me a few weeks back. Uh, I was taking off, um, we were climbing out, we were about 6,000 feet climbing, and we saw on our weather radar that there were some more um, yellow, um, kind of amber returns further on. So we contacted air traffic control and asked for a radar heading, which we got, and we avoided it on the stipulated distances. But all of a sudden, there was just this crack, this bright light and this little pop, and then disappear. Okay, and I knew from experience that that was a lightning strike. We were actually hit by lightning. Okay, um, so what we did was what we always do. We check our engine parameters, we check our instruments, we check our pressurization, and everything appeared normal. So we continued to our destination. And this is typically what happens in case of a lightning strike. Okay, so lightning strikes tends to happen to aircraft normally. The most common altitudes is between 5,000 feet and 15,000 feet while climbing or descending uh, in precipitation. So it generally happens when the aircraft is inside of a cloud. Okay? Uh, it happens generally when the temperature outside is about 0 degrees Celsius, that's about 32 degrees Fahrenheit. And when it comes to damages to the aircraft, it highly depends on how severe the lightning strike is, as in how much energy is inside of the lightning and how long 
did the lightning strike last, all right? So typically what tends to happen is that the, um, the part of the aircraft that is being struck tends to be the most protruding part. So for example, the uh, nose, the red dome of the aircraft, uh, any probes, pitot probes, alpha veins, um, static ports actually, even though they're not protruding, um, engine cowlings, the, uh, the wing tips, the engine, sorry, the, um, the tail or the vertical stabilizer, um, sorry, the horizontal stabilizer. So those are the thing, those are the places where the lightning tends to enter. All right? The way that we generally see this is if we know if we're coming into an area of highly charged um, clouds, we might get something called St. Elmo's fire. St. Elmo's fire is a, it looks like um, almost a, a spider web of um, charges that's running, kind of moving across the windshield or other parts of the aircraft. And um, if you've ever seen one of those toys, you know those, those um, globes, the plastic or glass globes that has a little charge to it. And if you put your finger on it, the charge moves towards your finger. That's almost exactly how, um, how St. Elmo's fire looks. It's actually quite beautiful and it's not dangerous at all. But it is an indication that we're in an area where there's a lot of um, electrical charges, okay? So the other thing that you might see, but not always, is kind of a yellowish glow as the air in some parts of the aircraft is being ionized, okay? That ionization is the beginning of a leader, an electrical leader moving out from the aircraft to meet up with a leader from the cloud. And when those two meet, that's when the lightning strike occurs, okay? The lightning will then enter the aircraft and it will come out in a different part of the aircraft. But the aircraft is built like a perfect Faraday's cage. Okay, and a Faraday's cage basically what that means is that all electrical charges is being conducted on the outside of the skin of the aircraft. It will never go inside. So you as a passenger sitting inside or me as a pilot will not feel it. Uh, we will not be affected by it to any great extent. We will hear it, see it most probably. But the current, the, the, the bad part, the, the dangerous part is being conducted outside through the skin and then let down, down to the ground. Okay, so damages that typically occur, occur tends to be these tiny little holes. Okay, so we're talking holes in the skin of the aircraft, not penetrating the entire aircraft, but in the skin of the aircraft that is less than the size of a normal rivet. Okay, they tend to be a little bit burnt around these holes and there might be many, many of them. And then the same kind of little holes will appear where the lightning leaves the aircraft. You might also have damage to individual probes. So in our case, for example, when we landed at our destination a few weeks back uh, and we reported this, you always report it, tell engineering and engineering does a lightning strike inspection. And what they found was that the lightning had entered through the, um, the alpha vein, the one that shows the angle of attack on the first officer side, hit the uh, outer side of it and left the inner side of it. Okay, so it traveled through only that probe and it damaged it. It blew a little hole in it uh, that you could see it was a bit charred and so it needed to be replaced. Okay, but it had absolutely no effect on the actual indications in the cockpit or anything like that. So individual, individual uh, probes might be damaged. Uh, you might get um, in some very, very um, rare occasions, you might actually have holes burned in that affects pressurization. This happened on a very few occasions. Uh, sometimes it affects the engine, sorry, the engine instrumentations and the, um, like the compass because what happens when the lightning hit and is being conducted through the aircraft is that it can highly magnetize part of the aircraft and that can affect our compass, for example. It can affect things like uh, fuel readings as well. Those tend to be electric and they can be affected by the high current that's moving through. Um, but those tends to be the kind of damages, if any damage that, that, that we experience, okay? And these damages are in no way dangerous to you guys. Now, anyone who sees a lightning hit the aircraft, if you're looking out to the wing and you see it, obviously it's gonna be afraid, it's gonna be concerned, but don't be, right? In most cases, nothing happens at all to the, um, the people inside of the aircraft. Good, so, um, what happens if you're flying an aircraft that's made out, of, made out of composites then? Because aircraft like the 737 who's built out of metal obviously is conducting the current very uh, easily, but 
aircraft that's built out of composite materials, the composites are not as good conductor as a metal is, and that is a problem because it means that the um, there's a potential for greater damage because if the energy comes in that cannot be conducted on, the energy will then be affecting that area worse, right? Now, obviously, the aircraft manufacturers is aware of this, right? They wouldn't be building an aircraft that couldn't take a lightning strike because, as I said, it happens now and then. So the way that this has been solved is by creating a conductive skin on the aircraft, okay? So even though the, the, the actual supporting structures of the aircraft is built out of composite, it will still have a metal skin and it will have conductors put in between individual components to make sure that if the lightning hits any part of the aircraft, it can easily be moved out and then let go down, in, down to the ground again. So these aircraft that's built out of composite, unless there's something wrong with the actual uh, conductors, like you can have, for example, um, these conductive bridges between the nose of the aircraft, who tends to be built by composites, and the rest of the aircraft, and if they weren't, wouldn't be um, installed properly, then you could have a larger damage to the nose. As an example but this forms part of normal maintenance they're always being checked making sure that this is all um, working properly and after lightning strike all of these um, conductors are also checked again to make sure that they haven't been damaged by the high current right so no problem with that okay now lightning strikes can also happen on the ground now last week there was a lightning who actually hit part of the fueling station in London Stansted. If you had the Mentor Aviation app, you would have received a push notification about that because it has some real extreme impacts on the operations on Stansted since none of the aircraft could get fueled. Um, they were diverted all over the place and the people who were actually there, they were stuck on the ground for hours. And this is one of the, the good things with having the Mentor Aviation app, by the way, to get those kind of updates. So, Check it out, there's a link to it here in the description. Anyway, whenever there is lightning activity, thunder activity, lightning activity close to an airport, you will see that the ground operation, especially the fueling, will cease, okay? Because A, it's dangerous. There's fuel, you know, the fuel vapor that could potentially be ignited by lightning. And also, the fueling in itself is actually an event that creates quite a lot of electricity because there's so much fuel being moved through the hoses that that you know, creates a lot of, of um, potential static energy as well. That's, by the way, if you've seen fueling going on, you will see that the first thing that the fueler does is they take a grounding cable and they connect that to the aircraft to make sure that there is no uh, static buildup being created that could cause a fire. But in the case of thunderstorms and, and lightning activity, they don't take any risks. We don't do that. So you will see that all ground operation, especially fueling, would cease and wait until the storm cloud has moved away and then it will continue, okay? Now, if an aircraft would be hit by lightning on the ground, and this has happened on a few occasions, then the, it's a slightly different case, all right? Because the lightning will always try to find the easiest way down to the ground. That's why it's going through the aircraft in the first place. If we are doing pushback, for example, you, we will typically have someone connected with a headset to the aircraft that is leading and checking that there's no obstacles and that everything is going okay with the starting of the engines. If an aircraft will be hit by lightning during pushback, the easiest way for the lightning to move through the aircraft and down into the ground is going to be through the skin of the aircraft, in through the headset of the person, through the person and into the ground. And that could be extremely dangerous for the person who's being uh, who's doing the pushback. And this has actually happened if you um, watch this video here um, before. Now this, this person survived, but this would be extremely dangerous. Okay, so we tend to, we tend to take this into account whenever we are dealing with, um, with lightning, thunderstorms, we tend to just wait until the worst past has passed and then we will start our operation again. Right guys, um, something that I have noticed, by the way, during the last few years that I have been operating is that this thunderstorm activity, especially in Europe, is getting more and more um, severe. Every year the thunderstorms get bigger, they get more frequent, and this could be an indication of the change in climate in general. All right. Um, now, I don't have any backup for that, but it's just a feeling that I have had during the last few years. Now, if you guys 
want to learn more about things like the greenhouse effect, for example, or just the general stuff happening in nature and around you, I, I highly recommend you once again to check out brilliant.org. There is a, a course called Physics of Every Day that will show you things like, for example, weather patterns, greenhouse effect, things like that. And uh, like I said, Brilliant.org has a way of making you learn maths and physics in a way that's really interesting. So check out the link to it down here below. Just click it. The 256 first of you who uses that link will get a discount on the yearly subscription of Brilliant. But to check it out is completely free. Okay? Before I go, I also want to make a shout out to all of the channels from which I've borrowed a little bit of material to make these videos. Now, whenever you see a cool video, when I'm using something to, to explain whatever I am explaining in the video, um, that might have been borrowed by a different channel and that will always be linked to down here in the description of the video. So just go down now, check the different channels out and click them and check out. You might get the full video then, which might be something really, really good and interesting for you to learn. So wherever you are out there in the world, as always, I hope you're doing absolutely fantastic and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.